U.S. and China are no longer talking. Xi Jinping is consolidating his power, and Twitter is easing up on Chinese state media. Then more on this week's China News Headlines. China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. This episode is sponsored by Incogni. Now, you probably know that companies are collecting your personal data, but you may not realize just how many. Dozens, maybe hundreds, most of which you've never heard of. And you have no idea what they're doing with it. Incogni helps stop them. I'll explain more at the end. U.S.-China relations haven't been great for a while. One could argue there was still a relationship, though. Now, I'm not so sure. Tensions between the U.S. and China already high, including over China's spy balloon, which NBC News reported exclusively was picking up electronic signals intelligence. U.S. officials tell NBC News that diplomatic and military communications between the U.S. and China are now almost non-existent. U.S.-China relations are almost at sitcom levels of bad. I wouldn't be surprised if China draws a line down the center of the earth and says, you stay on your side and I'll stay on mine. First off, we're both on the same side of that line. Second, that's the equator, you dolt. Anyway, China has been ghosting the U.S. During the spy balloon incident, China refused to pick up the phone for U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Okay, the genocide, torture, and forced organ harvesting, those are pretty bad. But leaving the U.S. military on red? That is truly evil. But at least the U.S. and China still had diplomatic communications. They aren't even accepting phone calls, military to military. Even during the Cold War, we had a hotline. Isn't there a real risk of miscalculation of an accident? Well, we, first of all, we do maintain diplomatic uh, communication. Um, but not ability. military to military, which military is really what matters. Military to military is something that we will strengthen. It was a hotline? Well, no wonder China isn't answering. Hotlines are like five bucks a minute. But now it appears that even diplomatic communications aren't happening at a high level. Prior to when Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen met with U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, Politico reported that the Biden administration is dealing with Chinese counterparts on normal day-to-day -day matters via mid-level officials. Now, apparently, since Tsai's visit, things are worse. Addressing concerns that Tsai's meeting could provoke Beijing to attack Taiwan and destabilize the region, Blinken and other Biden administration officials have said that Chinese officials have not been receptive to talks on this and other fronts where relations have frayed. The silent treatment, really. What's next? Are they going to stamp their feet and hold their breath? Real mature China. It's no mystery why China is doing this. China wants to make the U.S. pay for what it thinks are slights against it. Like shooting down its totally civilian spy balloon and meeting with its perceived enemy. A spokesman for China's foreign ministry described it like this. Communication should not be carried out for the sake of communication. The White House needs to show sincerity to help bring China-U.S. relations back to the right track. No communication for the sake of communication. But what if the U.S. just wants to talk about their day? Why does everything have to be so official with you, China? Can't we just keep this casual? And who decides when relations are back on track? Well, China, of course. Unfortunately, the U.S. has fallen into this trap. China knows its destabilizing activity in the South China Sea and elsewhere puts the U.S. on edge. And not having open lines of communication makes the U.S. even more nervous. China wants to get the U.S. on its knees, begging for more communication, because it makes the U.S. look weak. And that's exactly what the U.S. has done. The U.S. has been trying to get meetings with Chinese counterparts for Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, and Joe Biden. And no surprise, China's been radio silent, at least in public. I bet they're in a group chat with other authoritarian nations talking behind America's back. If they're evil enough to leave someone on red, they're capable of anything. Not all Western leaders are having this problem, though. France's president got a red carpet welcome in Beijing last week which might not be as nice as it sounds since in communist countries, every carpet is red. He even got a taste of what it's like to be a dictator. Wow, in a democracy, leaders don't get treated like this. They get treated like this. 
Emmanuel Macron's warm welcome in China could be due to, how do I say it nicely, his kowtowing? After the trip, he told reporters that France shouldn't blindly follow the U.S. and get involved in the China-Taiwan conflict because France wouldn't be able to influence China anyway. So what's the point, right? He said Europeans cannot resolve the crisis in Ukraine. How can we credibly say on Taiwan, watch out, if you do something wrong, we'll be there? The question Europeans need to answer, is it in our interest to accelerate a crisis on Taiwan? No. The worst thing would be to think that we Europeans must become followers on this topic and take our cue from the U.S. agenda and a Chinese overreaction. Hmm. And here I thought that stereotype of the French always surrendering wasn't true. This should be their new national flag. And to all my French viewers, it's not you, it's your leadership. Of course, France surrendering on Taiwan is exactly what China wants. Because if China thinks Taiwan won't have backup during an invasion, the invasion is much more likely to succeed. As you can imagine, Macron's comments didn't sit well with the U.S. Our allies' position, if, if in fact Macron speaks for all of Europe, and their position now is they're not going to pick sides between the U.S. and China over Taiwan, then maybe we shouldn't be take, picking sides either. Maybe we should basically say we're going to focus on Taiwan and the threats that China poses, and you guys handle Ukraine and Europe. Wow. China divided allies, and now they're ready to conquer. There should be a name for that military strategy. Maybe something like the old wamboozle. An international group of legislators told Macron, Monsieur le Président, you do not speak for Europe. Poland's prime minister this week called the U.S. the absolute foundation for Europe's security. And in response to this, a bald eagle carrying the American flag said, <laughs> which is eagle for USA. And after the break, while France may not be able to see it, the Chinese regime is really acting like the world's biggest dictatorship. Welcome back. Just as Macron was leaving China, China started military drills around Taiwan. China had warned of vague consequences before Tsai's visit to the US, and I guess this was it. I'll have more on that in tomorrow's episode, so stay tuned. China also waited till Macron left to sentence two prominent civil rights lawyers. You know, in case France might be reminded that it's dealing with a dictatorship. It's kind of like how at the beginning of a relationship you try to hide your crazy. Only instead of it being you're really into Guy Fieri fan fiction, it's that you're a dictatorship. China sentenced Xu Zhuyong and Ding Jiaxi to 14 and 12 years respectively. They have been charged with subversion for promoting what they called a new citizens movement, which encouraged ordinary Chinese to exercise rights such as free speech, guaranteed by the country's constitution, at least in theory. Yes, in China, even if you're following the law, you're not necessarily safe. Also, them claiming the constitution guarantees them free speech isn't how you get free speech in China. That's just how you get a bunch of whiteout all over the constitution. And in case there was any doubt China is vying for the title of most authoritarian state, China recalled millions of newspaper copies last month. What was the problem? Xi Jinping's name was left out. That's right. Instead of writing Comrade Xi Jinping, it only said Comrade. Which to me seems like the opposite of disrespect. Wouldn't being known just by Comrade mean that your fame supersedes your name? And isn't it disrespectful to line the bottom of a birdcage with your name? It's a way grosser form of whiteout. Anyways, the government ordered a recall of an estimated 3 million copies of the People's Daily. And now, many reporters inside China speculate that Tuo Jun, the current chief editor and president of People's Daily, may be purged due to the incident. If you're thinking China's become just a bigger North Korea, I'd say North Korea is just a smaller version of China. The cult of personality gets worse, so Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and the ideologies of previous Chinese leaders have been deleted from a new government rulebook. Apparently, Xi doesn't want anything but his doctrine, Xi Jinping thought, being referenced in official documents anymore. Which is what I would do if I were a dictator for life. Why give anyone else the credit when you can take it all for yourself? But why stop at just Xi philosophy, though? Why not teach? She math, she science, and she dessert recipes. 
And that's just where if anyone complains about your cooking, you make them disappear. The new rules also forced the country's cabinet, the state council, to run all major decisions past the party leadership. Or in other words, Xi Jinping has to sign off on everything now. It shouldn't come as a surprise then that last month, the party launched a campaign to purge black sheep and two-faced people. Figurative, not literal. Because you know the CCP would be on the same side as any Batman villain. The party launched a nationwide disciplinary campaign that will inspect its 96 million members for loyalty to Supreme Leader Xi Jinping and weed out officials from positions of power who were put there by rival political factions. Like I said before, being a party official is a dangerous job. Almost as dangerous as a newspaper editor who messes up once. And after the break, is Elon Musk's chumminess with China starting to show on Twitter? Welcome back. Elon Musk announced that his electric vehicle company Tesla is building a new battery factory in Shanghai. The facility will produce large batteries that will help electric utilities stabilize grids and use more renewable energy. Which sounds like a good thing, stabilize grids, use more renewable energy. But some are concerned about Tesla's reliance on China. Tesla manufactures a lot of its vehicles in China. China is also one of the biggest consumers of its vehicles. In fact, Morgan Stanley said last year that Tesla should be treated like a Chinese tech stock because up to a half of its profits come from China. It's no surprise that Elon Musk is planning a trip to China, or that he's trying to get a meeting with China's new premier, Li Qiang. Li Qiang was party secretary of Shanghai before he came premier, and he reportedly wooed Tesla to open a factory there so the two already know each other has to hurt since America was actively trying to reach out to China and it was out there wooing some other guy. You're a hussy, that's what you are, China. But here's where it gets problematic. Elon Musk isn't just the CEO of Tesla, he's also the CEO of Twitter. And before he took over Twitter, there was concern that his business in China would make Twitter more China-friendly. Not that Twitter was great in that department before Musk took over. Twitter executives back then reportedly cared more about growth than spies, including a Chinese spy infiltrating the company. Although, like their balloon, I'm sure they'll claim that was just a civilian spy, just doing it as a hobby, abroad, in a sensitive location. But fears about Musk's China connections may have come home to roost. Semaphore found that Twitter has gone against its own policies by no longer policing Russian and Chinese state-backed media. In 2020, before Musk took over, Twitter blocked state media from appearing in search results. Now, however, they're some of the top results. We tested words like peoples and global, and state media were all suggested. The beginning of Xinhua also brought up the official Xinhua Daily account, which is disappointing because when I type in peoples, it should autofill an elbow if you smell what the rock is cooking. One Voice of America reporter found that state-backed media is now also being recommended in his For You feed. Twitter has apparently also stopped flagging tweets that contain links to state media. It used to be that if someone shared a link to state-run media, there was a Stay Informed sticker that was added to the tweet. Now that's gone. Some before emailed Twitter for comment, and Twitter replied, I kid you not, with a poop emoji which actually doesn't have anything to do with the subject and everything to do with Twitter's lack of a communications team, apparently. Any emailed questions get an auto-reply of a poop emoji now. So yeah, you can tell that Musk has a great relationship with the press. It also didn't help Musk's reputation that Twitter recently slapped NPR with a state-affiliated media label. Twitter removing controls on Chinese state media right as Musk is trying to get high-level meetings in China seems suspicious. But so far, there's no proof that they're connected, just like Xi removing references to other people's philosophies doesn't mean he's an insecure dictator. He's just a brilliant strategist. After all, he's the inventor of the old wamboozle. This episode is sponsored by Incogni. Whenever you do anything online or use apps on your phone, there's a huge number of companies that collect your personal data. When I signed up for Incogni last year, I discovered that there were dozens of data brokers that potentially had my private information without my permission. I talked earlier about spies infiltrating Twitter. Well, apparently that wasn't even the worst of it. A former Twitter exec 
says that Twitter collects vast amounts of user data and that it doesn't have the cybersecurity infrastructure to really protect it. So not only did Twitter employees have easy access to tons of user data, but it was an easy target for hackers. Hackers like the ones who reportedly stole 200 million email addresses earlier this year and posted them on an online hacking forum. This just goes to show that even the biggest companies can get hacked. So what can you do? Get as many companies as possible to delete your data off the internet. Incogni helps you do that. Incogni has already gotten my details removed from 131 of these data brokers, with a lot more in progress. And I didn't have to do anything after signing up. Incogni handles it for you. So if you're worried about privacy, I recommend you get Incogni for yourself. Click the link below or go to incogni.com slash uncensored. The first 100 people to use the code uncensored will get 60% off. Get your personal data off the market with Incogni. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.